Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the College of Letters and Science Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm David Cherry, Chair of the Department of History and Philosophy, and I would like to introduce Dr. Nicole Ray, Dean of the College of Letters and Science, who will introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dean Ray. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Um, this, I think, is the third CL uh, College of Letters and Science Distinguished Lecture uh, for this semester, and it's the first one from the latter side of the house. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome to uh, Montana State a um, uh, longtime colleague, mentor, and dear friend. Uh, Dr. Darden Asbury Pyron of, from the History Department at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. Um, Dr. Pyron is a South Carolinian. Uh, he studied at Furman University, he got his PhD from the University of Virginia. Um, he was a founding faculty member of Florida International University in 1972. <coughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think you came in 71 and the students came in 72. Um, and uh, a little bit of extra information, Florida International University is actually the Miami branch of Florida State University system. Uh, and um, we have an FIU alum in the audience, uh, Ms. Paul Beswick. Um, at any rate, um, I think Dr. Pyron was an early chair of the history department, and he helped build that department um, to a department that now offers a full range of degrees from undergraduate to doctoral, and is one of the strongest history departments probably in the southeastern region of the U.S. He was also very much involved with FIU's Honors College. Uh, both uh, in uh, launching it and as a longtime faculty member there. He is the author of two major biographies. One, Southern Daughter, biography of Margaret Mitchell, which was published in 1991 by Oxford University Press. And then Liberace, an American Boy, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2000. Most recently, he has, I think, completed his editing of a new edition of the Memoirs of General Sherman. And if you look at Dr. Pyron's three subjects, I think that tells you all about it. <laughs> in many ways. Um, in terms of his teaching, uh, Darden regularly teaches classes in Greek and Roman history, on the American Civil War, and on American cultural history. Um, he has been a dedicated and award-winning undergraduate teacher and a dissertation advisor for graduate students. He was honored uh, a couple of years ago when he received uh, Florida International University's Outstanding Professor Award. Uh, today he's going to talk about biographical writing, something that, uh, something on which he's uh, supremely well qualified uh, to discuss with you today. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome to the program Dr. Darden Asby Barber. He told me that, yeah, he, as he told you, that I'm the first person in the, the letters part of it, and I, he said that the first two speakers in this program <clears throat> were doing abnormal psychology and cancer. So I hope we're moving up beyond that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is the first time I've been in this part of the world. I'm happy to be with my friend Nicole, who's been my friend for 25 years. Um, you're lucky to have him, and I feel uh, still I still regret his loss in Miami and from my university. I've been enormously impressed, uh, not just with the landscape here, but with students and faculty. I asked Nick to run off a copy of all of the History Department people, which I have before me. Uh, I find it very impressive, 
And yesterday I did a pro seminar. How many, were any of you in the, in the seminar I did yesterday? <coughs> a couple of you. Um, I, I was even more impressed, I'm not more impressed than faculty members, but wonderful students who asked good questions and did their homework. So I'm hoping that <coughs> what I'm gonna give for you today <coughs> is going to be worthy of the kind of stuff that I found on the ground here. I wanna do four or five, I wanna talk generally about biography relations between biography and history, um, and I have four or five points that I want to make this first about the origins of history and biography in the Greek world, Greek and Roman world, subsequent history of it down to 1919, the extraordinary uh, affair of history and biography as the 20th century dawn, and the particular problems of academic history and biography in the contemporary world and close uh, with the idea of the promise and potential meaning of, of history of writing. Along the way, hopefully, I'll illustrate some of these things with some uh, examples from my own work. It's critical to understand at the very beginning uh, that, uh, that both history and biography are cultural specific. They're inventions of the Greek world, uh, history being invented at the end of the fifth century in Athens, and biography about 200 years later, um, given a great boost by Alexander the Great. Both history and biography have common assumptions uh, and definitions about human activity that other people in the world simply did not and in large measure still do not share. The critical element of this is the worth of the individual or of the citizen. In a weird way, and my students, uh, this gives my students fits because they really are American, but the Greeks invented something like individualism or like personality. This is just all over the record in Greek history the Greeks signed things. They left a mark. We know engineers, we know architects, we know sculptors, we know poets, we know painters, we know soldiers and generals, all leaving their marks. It's not merely giving personality to individual folks, but they personalized objects. <clears throat> Two of my favorite things at in, in all of Greek culture, museums, the, at the Museum of Olympia, where they ran the Olympic Games, there are two objects. I'm sitting there, you know, the Japanese tourists are falling by me and like wondering why this old guy is crying. Off in one corner is a, a Corinthian helmet from probably about 500 BC, and scratched in the side of it is uh, Scrafito Miltiades Dedicated. Miltiades, of course, is the Athenian general who led, the, who defeated the Persians at Marathon. In this direction, there's a, a, a fragment of a bowl, and it says, written on it is, I belong to Phidias. Phidias, of course, was the great sculpture of 5th century, of 5th century Greece. That is, the objects themselves acquire personality, um, and so forth. This is an interesting problem. It is the idea that somehow individual worth uh, individual creativity, individual personality are, are important and make the world go around in effect. So I have two forms, I have two literary forms. History, I mean from the Greek word investigation or inquiry, is the record of the collectivity of these citizens. One of the ways I try to get this across to my students is that uh, people referred not to Athens, or not to Sparta, or not to Thebes, or not to Ephesus, or, or wherever, but the cities were called the Athenians. That is, the cities were nothing more nor nothing less than the collectivity of these individual citizens, of the individual people. History was the record, as conceived by Thucydides and, and earlier Herodotus, of the rise and fall of, this, of these collectivities of citizens. Biography is a kind of logical outgrowth of this interest and emphasis on the worth of the individual. Even before biography was invented, 
you have the emergence of vivid characters in Aristophanes. Have any of you ever read Aristophanes? Son? The Fields of White and the Harvest, out there. Uh, <clears throat> Aristophanes, is, he, he made fun of, of famous people, but he also introduces ordinary folk as well. Plato does the same thing. I want to ask for a show of hands about uh, Plato, because I'd probably be disappointed, but I don't care. Uh, the, the dialogues, uh, the Lysias, or the, or the Republics, starring, in effect, Plato. So that the culture was primed to deal with the lives, careers, uh, existence, in effect, of individual folk. The great boost of biography came with Alexander the Great, who died in 323, and what happened uh, BC, and what happened soon after that is, here's a character who simply reformed the world. So if there were any doubt about, uh, about the importance of individual initiative or individual cre uh, creativity, Alexander, uh, uh, Alexander banished that and also produced the rise of uh, produced biography itself. I said before, one of the things that's interesting about this, and why I spend so much time talking about it, it's a problem for us, and it came up in our seminar yesterday, is that this is cultural specific. It is, as I said, most people, uh, even in the world today, don't have the same sense of individual creativity that we do in the West. Uh, I recently, I'm doing a course in, in biography now, <clears throat> and it's been a kind of a problem assigning proper text. <coughs> Historians don't often write about uh, being biographers or doing life studies, but one of the guys had written a biography of uh, a character in mid 20th century Chinese history, uh, and one of the points that he made in this essay is that you have to take an entirely different approach to doing biographies when you're doing biographies of non-Western people. This applies not just to Chinese, for example, but also even within, uh, within contemporary society. I mentioned yesterday, uh, one of my students was born in Dresden. He grew up uh, in, the, in East Germany under the communist regime. And he raised the issue of what does it mean to produce biography what did it mean to produce biography in, in a communist country? Certainly, Western, the East Germany is part of Western Civ. Um, and he said it, it's, it's an entirely different kettle of fish. Something else is going on there. So your biography as a literary form and uh, history as a literary form and biography as a literary form, these two have played uh, back and forth in tension. In one draft of this uh, talk, I had an statement of the introduction of life of Alexander, which is really cool, which he says, I'm not writing history. I'm producing biography. So there's a certain tension between the two forms, literary, literary forms, but they're drawing on the same kind of source. That is, Plutarch is writing, uh, Plutarch, the, the great, uh, the great uh, first really great biographer whose works we have, uh, The Lives of No Greeks and Romans, which he wrote around 100 AD. He's writing biographies of historical figures. Now, this is important for itself, so that there's a, a kind of play back and forth here in the earliest years between biography and history. That breaks down with, uh, with the fall of Rome and the emergence of Christianity in the Western world. Between 400 and 1400 BC, the normal categories that would have been recognizable in the Greco-Roman world simply don't apply anymore. One of the neatest uh, examples of this uh, is life of Charlemagne. Charlemagne uh, saw himself uh, in the 8th and 9th centuries as being the inheritor of the Greco-Roman tradition. Uh, and there are two biographies of him. They're really neat. One of them is a high Latin, Ciceronian, Plutarchian sort of version of him. And the other one represents a kind of fantastic Middle Ages, I don't want my, my medievalists to complain about this, but Dark Ages version uh, of, of the great man. They're entirely different. What happens is that you have saints' lives, but the saints' lives don't fit into any kind of normal pattern, Greco-Roman pattern of biography. So that frequently they would simply get the same biography and simply change the names of the characters so that they're meant to be uh, types rather than individuals. 
Now, the Renaissance, all of this is recovered. And I guess I talked to David, the, the really important, critical importance of your adding Renaissance historians in your program here. Um, the recovery is interesting. So you know about portraits. We know about uh, this revival of, uh, of, of anatomically correct characters and so forth. This applies to biography as well, but the nature of biography changes as well. So that the integration of history and biography doesn't really work exactly right. You have Vasari's Lives of the Artist, which was printed, published in 1550 or so. Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography, which he published, which he wrote simultaneously, which wasn't published for another another hundred years. This goes up. This kind of tradition of interest in not necessarily political or not necessarily public figures, but in artists and poets, in some ways reaches a peak with Samuel Johnson and his biographer James Boswell. It's a flowering of biography. <clears throat> but not necessarily historical biography, the kinds of things that interest me. By the 19th century, the things come back together again. Uh, as I've told you before, I'm teaching this course in biography, and uh, most of the text that I assign my students, for want of anything better, are biography, are studies of biography by literary figures that deal with biography in fact, not as an historical subset of, of history, but a subset of literature. The literary people just hate 19th century biography and usually skip over it in the space of, uh, of a couple of pages, not even a full chapter to it. The 19th century, however, represents a really coming together of history and biography. Uh, not that many people read this stuff. In my house in Miami, I have the full volumes of the presidential papers from George Washington uh, to Grover Cleveland that was collected by my great-grandmother. And as far as I know, it has never been opened. Um, part of the problem there. But there's a kind of marker here that's interesting as well. Uh, I don't know that any of you have ever read Thomas Carlyle. He used to be a uh, critical assignment in both intellectual history courses as well as in as well as in literature courses. But about 1840, he published a book called On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History, which in my mind pulls the idea of, in effect, makes biography even trump, <coughs> trump history. It is that if you wanted history, you read biography. 19th century, of course, is the great century of heroes, uh, whether uh, Napoleon, uh, Abraham Lincoln in the United States, literary figures, or people who cross over between literary figures, li literary literature, and politics like, <coughs> like Israeli. 20th century, all of that breaks down. Um, and this is represented in, again, another classic sort of text and all books on biography will deal with Lytton Strachey's uh, Eminent Victorians, which he published in 1918. I give it to you as a kind of marker. It represents the world turned upside down. Now, if you, if you do modern uh, intellectual history, especially modern European intellectual history, you get some sense of how uh, the World War I insti effectively institutionalized the collapse of culture uh, that is apparent in European history even by 1890. The public sphere is radically realigned. <coughs> in this regard, this is something how in, any kind of literary form can suggest larger issues and things that are going on in the social order. Um, so Strachey uh, wrote about four Victorians in that they, they are imminent but his use of the term is effectively ironic. Um, that is, he's interested in the private, the personal, the domestic, and in particular, in using the private, domestic, and personal as a means of undermining the public models and so forth. You don't have to bite on that. You should
should all know about the impact of Freud uh, in the world in general, the idea that history is about hidden meaning. Now, when you're emphasizing <coughs> hidden meaning, the, the, the problem with that is de-emphasizing public meaning. I've gone so far as to say that these things, as represented in biographical writing, represent the collapse of history <coughs> itself. <coughs> radical redefinition of the public sphere in terms of the interest or even obsession with the private, the personal, the hidden, and the obscure. Another little marker here of what's happening is a book that was written by Woodrow Wilson's former friend, colleague, Colonel Edward House, which he co-authored with Freud, a bizarre, but indicative biography of Woodrow Wilson after, after the, the League of Nations fiasco in 1919-1941. <clears throat> World War II and the Great Depression changes things again. In effect, well, I teach, I'm teaching modern U.S. history as well, besides Greeks, Greeks and Ro Romans. Um, the Depression and World War II had particular impact in the United States in terms of sense that the world really is more positive, the public sphere really is more legitimate, uh, and so forth. And from 1945 until about 1970 is a kind of golden age in, in American history, biography writing, it, that has all sorts of representation. Some of this is there for work is still good. Is still good. Uh, one of my favorite versions of this is Richard Hofstadter's book. I love this. Richard Hofstadter wrote The American Political Tradition and the Men Who Made It in 1946. He's been dead 45 years and his heirs are still drawing royalties off of this book, which is still in print. Now, I like selling things. Uh, it's nice to know, even if I'm dead, that my heirs, too, might be drawing some money. I studied at the University of Virginia, as Nick said, um, and all of my professors <coughs> at the University of Virginia were biographers. I worked with a man who had written a major biography of Theodore Roosevelt. I worked with another one who had written a major biography of Henry Clay. Um, the chair of the department is a man who had done major studies of Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson. This is a kind of golden age of, of, of biography and history, or biography as history. Since 1970, and this is the world that you guys live in now, this, uh, there's been a, a, a different sort of shift about biography and history. Biography itself remains very, very popular. Uh, yesterday, when I was uh, doing the seminar with the graduate students here, who were just wonderful, I heard uh, One of the things I, I suggested is that they go to the bookstore, any bookstore, and look in the biographical section. There are tons of biographies. <coughs> Very few of them have been written by academic historians. Biography is left to professional writers to professional biographers, to journalists, and literary biographers. So academics still produce biography, but it's not historians. Uh, biography, literary biographies, is a major, uh, major genre of form of writing. Some of these are famous, some of you you've heard of, some of whom you might even have read. Desmond Morris, who's written biographies of Theodore Roosevelt, and a, a, a weird one of Ronald Reagan, uh, David McCullough, who's written biographies of almost everybody, Robert Caro, uh, and Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's the, the, the Lincoln, the, the Team of Rivals book, as well as a major study of, uh, of Lyndon Johnson. So that non-historians are producing this stuff. Carl Rollison, really careful, you write his name down, uh, who is a biographer himself, but a major reviewer 
of biographies as well, who has produced three or four books on biography, has insisted that historians cannot write pop proper biography. So here again is this kind of split between biography and history. He says that historians are too interested in the big picture. That is, historians are too interested in history. <laughs> well, whatever. <clears throat> His notion is that biography, to be true biography, has got to be personal, private, and so forth. He himself has not written biographies of public or political figures. This is not merely who does it or who doesn't do it, but there are very clear professional pre prejudices against biography among academic historians. Four years ago, uh, the American Historical Association, American Historical Review, which is the flagship journal of American history, had a round table on biography. I've assigned this round table, the, the discussions of this round table to my biography students. <coughs> I just hate it, but it doesn't matter whether I hate it or not, as I tell my students, that's the way it is. First of all, the editor of this, uh, it was published in the American Historical Association magazine journal, and the editor of that magazine said himself that historians, and this is a quotation, historians are skeptical of the capacity of biography to convey the kind of analytically sophisticated ah, interpretation of the past that academics have long expected. I, I think that's terrible writing, but that is neither here nor there. In effect, it is a degraded form of history. I'm true to my school. I really want to play the Montana Hunter against this guy. <laughs> but again, that is neither here nor there. The editor, the guy who put this, the, the round table together, who himself is a biography. As a matter of fact, he's just come out with a biography, and David Nassau has just come out with a biography of Joseph Kennedy, wrote this. Biography remains the profession's unloved stepchild. Occasionally, but grudgingly let in the door, more often shut outside with a riffraff. Graduate students are warned away from writing biographies as their dissertations. Assistant professors are told to get tenure and promotion before taking on biography. Colleges and university libraries adhere to collection protocols that discourage the purchase of biographies, even at NYU, where David Nesso is a professor, and the leading journals in, in the field, including the AHR, not least of all the AHR, the American Star Review, rarely ever publish articles that are biographical in nature and generally refuse to review biographical studies. <clears throat> HR has never reviewed any of my books, so there. <laughs> There's more. This is not just formal professional stuff. It hits another level. When the Margaret Mitchell book came out, it, it's a lots of copies. Uh, not one, but two of my <laughs> colleagues who liked me and respected me said this. They both said almost the same. Schumann was one of them, a very important copy of ours. I will assume I'm doing something wrong if more than 300 people, you might have said 300 eyes, which means 150 people, unless you're blind in one eye. Uh, I assume I'm doing something wrong if more than 300 people read anything I ever write. There are professional assumptions about history as a science as history writing as a production of professional papers, as in biology or <coughs> physics. Historians tend to write for reviewers. Uh, Oxford University Press, uh, which published the, the Morgan Mitchell book, uh, the editor, who was a very famous editor at the time, <coughs> said that they never, they, if anything sold 1,500 copies, they would consider it a bestseller. 500 copy, a 500 print run is more than norm. This doesn't even cover libraries in the United States. In effect, historians are writing for reviewers. 
have vulgar metaphors for this, which I will not repeat to you. They tend to be jargony, tends to be highly specialized writing, and I'll tell you a story. No, normally, by this time in my lectures, I would have had 500 stories. I even number them to my students. Uh, Brenda Butler Cern. Brenda Butler Cern was an older woman who came back to school. Uh, she was very wealthy. She was very Southern uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and an interesting character. She told me she made her first million dollars on a borrow 10000 loan from her father. I like that sort of stuff. I like kind of entrepreneurial stuff. She's reading a book. It's been assigned to one of her classes. And she said she kept falling asleep. <coughs> surely, I hope not, but surely all of you, even professors, have fallen asleep. You're reading a book at night. You tend to read at night. You fall asleep. The book closes. You say, where the hell am I? You open it again. You start reading again. And you're 10 pages into it. And you realize you've read it all before about a half an hour earlier. Go, Jesus. <laughs> well, Brenda Butler Cerns was not slouch. So she looks at the book. She does this like four times. Falls asleep. Oh, little story. She looks at the book. The guy's from Harvard. She says, okay, he's from Harvard. He must live somewhere around Cambridge, Massachusetts. So she calls information in Cambridge, Massachusetts, gets his number, and rings him up and says, Professor Gold, my name is Brenda Butler Cerns. I'm a student at Florida National University. I'm reading the book you just wrote. And I just would like you to tell me why it's written so miserably. God bless you. Oh, look. He chickened out. I think he chickened out. His response was not, I'm a poor writer, or I'm an undisciplined writer. He said, I write like this because it's the only thing that will get published. God help. In any case, this kind of highly specialized writing, scientific-like writing, uh, is reinforced not only by professional standards, but by all kinds of social forces that occur in the academy today, Marxist ideology, uh, theory, and so forth. In any case, all of this reinforces this narrow conception of what history, professional academic history, is about. Folks, in case you don't know it, Biography runs against all of that. What I'm saying now as I move <coughs> towards Roman number seven of my lecture uh, is not just for biography, because so many of you, if you're students out there, or even just folks out there from Bozeman land, um, this is not just about biography. It's about the potentials of history itself. And here are four or five of these things. First of all, Biographical writing, because of its very nature, enlivens and personalizes the historical process. It, in effect, humanizes historical writing. Along the same lines, number two, it reasserts effectively the role of agency or of contingency or choice, maybe even of free will. It has the same function for the historical process. So you are just, biography is about individuals who, who wrestle with their times, who adapt or fail to adapt to their times. But this is always this kind of vital tension that goes on between the individual uh, and society or individuals and times. Fourth, biography demands some way, or suggest literary virtues. The mere fact that biography is starring their beginnings, middles, and ends. So that a kind of clear-cut and traditional narrative is essential to biography. What it also means, however, is that you can play around with this. And this is the first analogy, first reference to my own work, I guess, in the Margaret Mitchell book, I'd lived with Margaret Mitchell for 10 years, um, and I'd given her life again. Uh, she died when she was only 48 years old. She was run over by a drunk driver in downtown Atlanta. Uh, and I just couldn't can't stand to kill her off. <laughs> and so in the last chapter of the book, she's still alive and kicking. And I decided to create 
as a literary form, an <coughs> epilogue in which she would die. But the epilogue has her death in the middle of the epilogue. So in effect, I'm playing with the permanence of her death, that is, so that using a literary form to suggest that she's only half dead or only half alive. What's going on here is the idea of then playing with beginnings, middles, and ends. You're playing with traditional narrative. A last one, I think it's the last one of these, benefits or slide good things about biography has to do with readership. I've already suggested that before. Um, Biography, almost of its nature, with its roots in as a literary form, suggest readers, not just other historians, or not just other people who are doing precisely what you're doing. In this regard, biography suggests the highest kind of notion, even moral, of art. That is, that we have something in common with other people. Failure, success, or all of this. In fact, all of the, the, the thrust of biography encourages good writing, self-conscious writing, even aesthetics, or at a minimum, style. I don't know if any historians ever talk about writing. I do all the time. First object, of course, of any writing. I just have a whole, I'm in my backpack there, I have student papers that I'm grading. Just fling my hair out if I had any. Uh, writing, one of my students said, Professor Pyron, the, the student evaluation, Professor Pyron fails to realize that this is not an English course. I'm like, oh, girl, every course that requires writing is an English course. How much do we emphasize writing, structure, not just aesthetics, but simply clear argument. But the kind of moral element about biography, ultimately that's connected, that's ingrained in Plutarchian writing from the first century AD, is a certain kind of morality. What is a good life? How should we live our lives? These kind of ultimate philosophical ethical and moral questions. And in this regard, one reference is a book. Uh, and Nick and I have talked about this a long time ago. Uh, Edmund White, uh, who's mostly famous as a, a novelist, wrote an extraordinary biography of Jean Genet. Jean Genet is a despicable character. He has <coughs> nothing to recommend him that I could see. Nick refused to read the biography because the subject of the biography is so, in effect, despicable. Um, I don't remember that. Yeah, sorry, you did. Uh, I um, can a good book, or even a moral book, about a wicked person? Edmund White's example. The benefits, then, as I've tried to lay them out in those A, B, C, D, E, in those five points just now, are some, are some of the benefits of writing. There are also liabilities and difficulties in doing biographical writing. Now, least of all, as I've also suggested, historians aren't used, aren't used to uh, literary production. Again, I talk to my students about this, that the Webster's dictionary, the Webster's definition of literature is writing of permanent worth or value. We simply aren't used to literary production. So we have to work at it. It's wonderful to do this. Uh, and again, another example from, from the Margaret Mitchell book. When I'm thinking about how I structure life, I've told you about the last chapter and the epilogue. Another example is about chapters, chapter production. So my idea here is that general people are going to be reading this book, general readership, and when you read, ah, night. That is, before you turn out the light. And so I thought, okay, I will write a chapter that is 
readable, that's comprehensible from beginning to middle to end, the individual chapters, uh, that's a, like a little short story with the idea of putting a, a hook on the end of it that would then make you eager to read another chapter that night uh, before your wife or, or husband or boyfriend turns out the light, um, or tomorrow night you read another chapter. In this regard, I used a literary model. Uh, maybe you know the story of Scheherazade. Uh, she is the, a member of the Shah's harem, and uh, he, um, <coughs> they do what they do, and then he kills his, uh, kills his bride of the evening. She told stories. Every night she would tell a new story with a tag on the end of it. Um, and so he didn't kill her, and finally he said, well, you know, these stories are so good, I think I'll just marry you and not kill you. This idea of leave people wanting more, which was a lesson of Liberace's book as well. So the one problem is the literary stuff. The next one is the problem, one of the major problems is that you have a two-tiered narrative. There's the history part of it, the times part of it, and the life part. As I suggested to the students yesterday, one of the ways to go about doing biography, one of the things I've instructed my students to do, is to make a list of all the potential patterns, all the ways that you might see a life. Although I would say the same thing is true about standard history, even, even social history. One of my students I found a guy, she, she's a former member of the military, she's German, another German in my class. She found a guy uh, named Eros von Borke. He is a German Junker aristocrat who came to the United States during the Civil War and rode with, uh, rode with Jeb Stewart. Uh, she's a lesbian. She's pretty out about this stuff. She's interested in that sort of stuff. And one of the things that she found is that Jeb Stewart said something like, as he's dying, he's the only man I ever loved. So she, of course, was all titillated by that. That's one potential pattern. There are a series of other patterns that you can take with any person. In this regard, I want to suggest to, to anybody who's interested in this sort of stuff, just look at your own life. What do you think is the center of your life? Or are we monocausal here? The answer to this is no. Our lives are diverse, and the lives that we study are diverse in the same way, I would say, History itself is diverse. So you look for patterns. Um, is somebody a, a writer? Is somebody, a, and with Margaret Mitchell, when I was constructing the, the chapters, one of the things I, I did is to set, is to assume that her life is open. I know, godlike, and you'll hear that again, that she's going to produce the greatest novel that's ever been written, the most popular novel that's ever been written. She doesn't know that when she's five years old. Chapter two. She doesn't know that when she's 12 years old. Chapter four. She doesn't know it when she goes away to Smith College when she's 17. So that at every, at the end of every, the chapters are then open because her own life is open. That is, one of the problems with assuming patterns or arguing patterns is that you, you can't use sledgehammers on your subject. But I would say this is not merely a function of biography It's easier when you're doing individuals to listen to what your subjects are saying. <clears throat> Hearing things you might not expect it to hear, seeing things that you hadn't anticipated, is your subject is alive again. We aren't merely illustrators. We aren't, we are, if you assume how complicated life is, and you have this sense of a, living, of a living organism out there that you're working with. The problem is imagining a life and imagining times and trying to get them both right. There are enormous problems with this. That is, what do you do when there are blanks in a person's life? Where was Liberace between 1940 and 1947? I don't really know. I worked pretty hard on the book. How do you deal with dishonesty? This is a great episode. Liberace gave two versions. I hope this doesn't fit anybody. Two versions. 
one to his boyfriend and one to a straight writer of the first time he got laid. <coughs> How do I deal with that? Do I say one is true and one is false? Well, no, what I did is like, kind of had a kind of mythic notion so that his first boyfriend, according to him, was a linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. Swell. His straight version of his first sexual encounter was with a tart with a heart. And he is an older woman who showed him the ropes and was sweet and so on. It's like two classic kind of fantasies, two mythological conceptions of sexuality uh, and so forth. How do you use other things? Like Margaret Mitchell was 4'10". What's it like dealing with really short people? <laughs> Both Margaret Mitchell and Liberace lied all the time. Sherman doesn't lie, but he certainly uh, stretches the truth. Sherman, that's the book I'm working with now. How do you do detective work? How do you try to, to decipher from the clue, see clues where even the writer himself not, might not have seen clues? I used this example yesterday. Um, in, Liberace, in, uh, in, in Sherman's memoirs, he has an ideal of Roman virtue, of the, of the virtuous Roman soul. Duty, loyalty, self-abnegation. At the same time, he had a comparable idealization of outliers, of weirdos, especially people who were dirty. And he talks about, and these two kind of elements coexist in his memoir. What I've used that as an argument is that these, rep these idealizations, these two types, represent a certain kind of bifurcation in his own, own character. So as I wind up, what's the object? The object is not only of biography, but of history itself, I think, of keep our, keeping our ear to the ground, or a stethoscope to the heart not merely of an individual man or an individual woman, but of a time. How our people represent the large currents in our, in, our, in our lives. How ultimately the question for me as a biographer, but also first as an historian, is how, how do you make the past live again? Not a moral lesson so much. And, uh, I'm a Bible reader. Um, I just finished last night the book of Ezekiel. I don't know if any Bible read it. Ezekiel is a real weird book of the Bible. One of the critical and most wonderful things, which is also the stuff of folk songs in the South, is dry bones. Ezekiel is commanded to go into the desert, and he sees all these dead bones. And God says to him, Ezekiel! Can these bones breathe again? And Ezekiel says, Lord, they will if you say they will. And so he says, Son of man, make the bones live again. This is the great joy and challenge to me of biography and of history itself. A joy and a challenge, but also a kind of divine purpose to make the dry bones of the past, whether an individual or people, get up and march around. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
truth of the episode of Matthew Shepard, who was murdered in Laramie uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and a part of this is speculation. I, I think a, a, a biographer, even professional biographers, or, or historical biographers have got to have some kind of identity with their subjects, but you don't have to sleep with them, literally. I think Capote is probably bonking around with some of the guys in the comic book. My name is Brett Walker, and I'm just curious, why is it that you think that biography is a, a Western form? Because, I mean, I can think of any number of uh, non-Western biographies. I can think of Eastern biographies of swords, people, tea vessels. I can think of commentary on Chuangzi, Lao Tzu, and Confucius. I can think of any number of things that would qualify as biography. I'm just curious, what evidence do you have that it's a Western form? Because it doesn't seem correct. It prejudice, I think. Um, how do you deal with this? Is some, this isn't this is an extremely interesting category to me. And there, there are a couple of ways of dealing with this. You can just say I'm wrong, which I guess. You did. Uh, but the idea of biography being, uh, as a literary form, being embedded within the culture, I simply don't know enough about, uh, about non-Western cultures. I, th this is an argument I have about politics with my Nigerian friend. Uh, that is, he argues that, that political order is, uh, despite the Greek origin of the term, is not, a, is not a exclusive. Greece and Rome and the West. Um, well, just I'll take you. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I mean, just as a cautionary note, I would say that just you're not knowing about it doesn't make it yes. true, right? Because there's a lot of very good work on that. Uh, I'll, I'll be interested in getting getting your information on that. So if ever I do anything more, if I give it again, nobody will catch me out on that. I didn't talk about that. I didn't, again, the idea was about professional biography. Um, biography, autobiography, and memoir are also uh, curious, uh, really interesting forms. Um, the, the Sherman book I'm working with now is based on his memoir. So you have autobiographies uh, and memoirs. Uh, these are. These are public. These are public forms intended for publication. Uh, do they advance? They certainly advance, consciously or unconsciously, a really clear-cut sense of self, of the self. Um, it's been really fun working with the Sherman biography. Uh, I'm, the next big article I want to publish after Sherman is on a comparison of Grant's memoirs and Sherman's memoirs. They simply fall into a different category. One of the problems about at this, uh, which I think is interesting, uh, as another uh, not attack of, of professionalist academic historians, but historians tend to look at autobiographies and memoirs as simply data tracks, without any assumption, without any understanding of autobiographies and memoirs as literary forms that are following certain conventions and so forth. So uh, in, the, in the half dozen biographies of William Tecumseh Sherman that have been published in the last 15 years or 20 years, um, only one of them makes any reference to the memoir itself. So it's like, this to me that's just insane because it has to do with, with uh, as Sherman's life is winding down, how he imagined himself in the world. Uh, so that, I, I, what I would say first of all, if, you, if we look at memoirs and autobiographies, we have to look at them within the context of a, a certain kind of literary, uh, among, within the context of literary conventions and so forth, that, these, that they're really important. Historians want to say, yes, he's right or he's wrong, and this is our emphasis on facts and data, uh, but there's simply other stuff going on other than that. Uh, really, really lovely. I, I love working with biographies and autobiographies. <laughs> you ended the third place race of all this with again, I like that. Now, can you combine um, a photobiography or memoir with uh, a historical experience? Uh, 
hope so. Because I would like the Sherman book to sell a lot. <laughs> There have been some war memoirs are wonderful. If any, have any of you ever in World War II courses, if any of you have read uh, With the Old Breed, anybody know the sledge book? That's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book, which is a memoir of living through, of living through the, the, the battle of, uh, well, actually, much of the war in the, in the Eastern Pacific. The same thing is true. There's another really neat book um, by a, he's, he's German, but he's from Strasbourg. And he serves in the in the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front. He's only about 19 years old, 18 years old, and wrote a major memoir. It's a huge fat book about his uh, his service in, in the war. Um, Gunter Grass wrote a much less successful one about being in the stormtroopers <laughs> uh, in, uh, in in the war. But certainly, it's like but what we do with those are historians. Is something other than other than what the what Sledge or or, uh, or Sherman or uh, or Gunter Gross might do with it. So that we have we have other obligations when we do this stuff. But I think I think it's you know, both leaving memoirs and also historians writing about them is, is really is a part of the process. larger purpose, I think, with biography. But again, you know, one of my students wrote a biography, wrote a, 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 a his dissertation, which has been published, on the Battle of Okinawa. And one of the chief sources of the battle was his own father, who participated in that battle. And he interviewed dozens of the soldiers who were fighting in this, this extraordinary conflict in World War II with 95% uh, Japanese casualties. There was, there was 7,000 people surrendered on it. Uh, the Japanese surrendered on Okinawa, and uh, 70,000 American. But he says people didn't remember right that they that none of his none of the people he interviewed could remember th anything after the first two weeks of the battle. He said like one more hill and so forth. But again, how much we I do oral his I've done oral history as well and. What people remember, how they remember, um, I think it's important that it's out there. But there, there's a, you know, the idea of history is giving a fuller story too. I think we have time for one more question. I think Professor Rydell. Oh, just one question for you about biography and methodology and you know, why biography might be interesting um, to a historian and maybe others. Um, the matter of charisma, most. People who write political biographies write about people who have some measure of charisma. And I confess, after multiple years in the history profession, having read lots of biographies, one of the puzzles that I still can't figure out is A, what constitutes charisma, and B, where does it come from? Well, the two, I have a story here. My old professor, his first biography, was about Theodore Roosevelt, uh, <laughs> who has lots of charisma, uh, polish, you know, this, you know, bully pulpit and all of this. The second book he wrote, the second biography he wrote, was of John W. Davis. If any of you have ever heard of John W. Davis, God bless you, or whatever. Um, he was a Democratic nominee for president in 1924. Burton Wheeler was his running mate. No, no, no. Sorry, in tw it was 24, he's running. He, was, he wound up his, his ambassador to England, the, the Court of St. James in World War II. Um, anyways, a, a real second-rate uh, famous guy who was devoid of charisma. And when uh, Harbaugh, my advisor, went in to interview Supreme Court justices, not least of all Felix Frankfurter, and he told him what he was doing, Frankfurter looked at him and said, why are you writing about him? Just because somebody lacks charisma doesn't mean that they aren't worthy of biographies or, or even fame. What is it? What constitutes reputation? 
Last story of the day. Is it about charisma? I don't know. I thought, okay, insofar as you're balancing life in times, they're different. You can get somebody who's battling against the times, somebody who represents the time, uh, or somebody who, um, uh, I guess, different categories of how people relate to the times. And I, I had this fantasy one time that the perfect subject of biography of modern, of, of, a, a, a representative person is Vanna White. So I thought I will write a biography of Vanna White to suggest the vacuity of contemporary American culture. But charisma, is that a, that's a fairly, I don't remember the term much used before John Kennedy. I'm not sure what we did before that, what the term that we used before that. But um, <coughs> panache, something like that, maybe. Uh, who had it's like who has it and who doesn't. Some of this has to do with reputation too. Um, who has it? Who doesn't? I give up. <laughs> Thank you so much.